Thank you so much. So, hi everybody. My name is Donald Robertson. I'm the Licensed Compliance uh, Manager at the Free Software Foundation. I've been there for about 10 years, uh, a little over 10 years now. Uh, and today we're talking about common uh, issues in free software licensing. Um, so even before I got involved with the Free Software Foundation as a, a lawyer back in law school and whatnot, um, I always found it, it's a lot of fun to deal with tough problems, right, when it comes to licensing. And I think I'm not alone in this because I spend a lot of my free time outside of work uh, on mailing lists and forums and whatnot, arguing about you know tough and interesting problems, uh, derivative works of software, uh, particular meaning of a, a term that's been poorly written or how multiple licenses combine. Uh, and I think this is something that um, it's obviously popular because I'm, I'm not talking to myself. It's something that other lawyers and law geeks are really interested in. And we spend a lot of time on it because it's a ton of fun. And these are, you know, they're kind of the tough problems. They're difficult. They don't necessarily have a correct answer at the end of the day, or at least not one that we can come to. We'll need a judge or somebody else to make the determination. Um, and so it makes those, those problems kind of ton, fun and exciting. Um, and saying that, uh, how fun and exciting those problems are, we're actually not going to be talking too much about them today because when I'm not in my free time, uh, at my work at the FSF, I work in what's known as the Compliance Lab. And this is essentially the, the licensing team for the, the Free Software Foundation. Uh, started about 20 years ago at this point. Um, for a long time before then, it was sort of an informal process involving RMS and some lawyers. And now it's a, a bit more formalized system that we have. Um, but so as part of my duties at the FSF, uh, one of the big things I do is GPL compliance, where um, we hold the copyright on a lot of the software for the GNU project, um, which is the project that made the fully free operating system. It's got tons of great software in there, like GCC and glibc. Um, but the developers of that software contribute the copyright to the FSF so that we can handle the compliance for them. So when a company goes out and starts selling a device that's just filled with a bunch of free software uh, binaries but no source code, uh, we can go and help those people to, to figure out how to fix their problems. Um, Another big area of, of my work is in doing certification programs. Uh, if you came by the table, I probably talked to you off a little bit about our Respects Your Freedom program, which is our program for certifying retailers who sell devices that come with all free software. Um, it's a really cool program, and it, it takes a, a substantial amount of my work at this point because it's a really growing program. We've got about 40 devices at this point, and I think I've got another 40 in the pipeline. Um, and so in that process is, is kind of similar to the GPL compliance work that I do, where I'm dealing with people who are not you know, violating the GPL, but instead are trying to make sure that the devices that they're shipping are, are fully free and that they only come with free software and that they're in compliance. Um, finally, the, the other big area of our work is education. So doing talks like this, but also publishing materials online on how licenses work and also frequently answering questions from the community. So if you ever have a licensing question, you can send it to licensing at fsf.org. Um, and myself and a team of volunteers will work to help you answer these questions. And the reality is that the questions and problems that I deal with as part of my job are very different from those tough problems that I deal with in my free time. Um, and so what we're focusing on today are the issues that I come across as part of my work all the time. These are the actual licensing problems in the real world where individual products, but also people who are potentially violating the GPL, these are the things that trip them up. And so it's kind of gonna be a bit of the basics. So if you already know how the GPL works, um, you're probably gonna know this stuff already, but you may find this kind of humorous and funny to see uh, what the reality is of uh, what GPL compliance work is really like. Um, so the most common uh, issue that free software projects have is that they don't include license notices. If you're familiar with the GPL, it comes as a nice big long license that explains all the rules of the road and gives people the terms and what the conditions are. But then in, on top of that, you also need to provide a license notice. And in doing uh, our certification work for like the free software directory, where we're going through and making sure a particular package is free software. This is pretty much like most of my contributions to free software projects is filing a ticket saying, you don't have a, a license notice. You should put license notices at least somewhere in your project. Um, so uh, 
we have a resource uh, called How to Use GNU Licenses, which explains how to actually apply the license to your package, which obviously the biggest step in that is including a copy of the license, but then also including the license notices. Um, these license notices have a few key pieces of information um, that the users of your software are really going to want to know about. Uh, one, it's got the copyright notice, so they know who the heck you are uh, that has made the software. Um, two, it lets them know that this particular file is actually under the GPL. And as part of that, it's even going further in that the GPL itself as a document, um, whether you're talking about GPL v2 or GPL v3, doesn't state whether you can use that license, uh, use that software under only that version of the license, or whether you can actually use the software under any later version. Um, and this is a key distinction because there can be lots of improvements to the GPL, as you saw going from GPL v2 to GPL v3. And if you have a software package that's GPL v2 only, you're not going to be able to necessarily take advantage of all those new uh, introductions. For example, the, uh, the compliance uh, forgiveness, where uh, GPL v2 is kind of harsh when you violate, your license is terminated, and you need to solve it right away. GPL v3 has a provision that allows you to come back into compliance on your own and essentially resolve the, the violation very quickly. Um, so, so the thing is that if you just have a copy of the license in your program, but you don't include your license notices, then no one's going to know what the deal is. They, they're probably going to assume that you're saying only this version of the license. But if that wasn't your intention, then the license notice is the way to make clear what is the actual versions that can, this software can be used under. Um, and finally, <laughs> this one may not seem critical because it's very rare that people get sued over writing bad software, but you should always want to have uh, warranty disclaimers and limitation to liabilities. That's included in the license notice. It's also in the copy of the license as well, but if someone grabs a piece of, you know, just one file from your project and runs off with it and they break something and they decide, oh, I'm actually going to try and sue this guy, you want to have those those warranty disclaimers in, involved. Um, so I talked a, bit, a little bit already about what's the point of these notices. You want people to know who wrote the software. Uh, you want people to know what version of the license it's under. Um, but a lot of people think, oh, you know, I could just put this in a readme somewhere. I don't have to put it in every single file in my project, do I? Um, and theoretically, yeah, you could do that. And maybe it won't necessarily cause problems. But I do know that people do come across files that have been separated from their original package. And they don't know necessarily what the package was because there's nothing at the top saying that this is a part of this particular program. And they suddenly go to incorporate it uh, into a project that cares about their licensing and wants to make sure they have their licensing issues correct. And they, they say, well, what the heck is this? What license is it under? And can we actually use it? And frequently, if you can't uh, hunt that down, you'll never be able to find it again. You essentially, you've got some code in your, your base that, you know, who knows where it comes from. But if there's a license notice at the top, then obviously that issue goes away and people will know all the information. Um, the last point is about whether it's a violation or not. This is a best practices thing for putting your license notices. And obviously if you're making your, if you've written your own package and you're the sole copyright holder, um, you're not gonna be able to violate on it anyways because you hold the copyright. Uh, and copyleft works via the power of copyright, so only the copyright holder is gonna be able to enforce against you. You'll probably get a notice from me saying, hey, please, fix your notices, um, but it's not, not necessarily going to be a, a violation. Um, for If you're incorporating other people's code, you definitely don't want to remove their notices because that would be a violation. So don't take out, out other people's license notices unless you get permission from them. Um, but in terms of like a project starting out, if you don't have your, your notices, you're not going to be getting in trouble, but this is an issue that you want to fix. Um, and it, the thing is, it's also a very easy issue to fix. Uh, when I file these bugs with projects about please get some license notices, um, I've had them fixed in as little as 30 minutes. Like as soon as they see, they're like, oh yeah, I can just automatically add the license notice to every file um, and it doesn't cause any issues. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple problem and it's the most common problem. It's the one you're gonna see all the time. You know, no questions about derivative works or uh, no questions about uh, what does a license mean? It's just literally 
they didn't read the bottom of the GPL where it says, you know, add these notices or check out the basic documentation. Um, so the second most popular, uh, was that a question back there? Oh, sorry. Um, so the second most popular issue, and this is a little bit bigger one, is no license. Um, you'll very frequently find software packages where someone's developed some code and they believe it's free software, but they actually haven't done anything about including a license. Um, sometimes you'll get this as people will just say, oh, my project is free software. Uh, you know, they don't have any license. They don't know what license they would even put it under. They just haven't thought about it. Although technically they, they'd probably say open source if they have this issue, but it's the same idea. It's that they, they want people to be able to use it and they believe that um, just by putting the code out there that you know, that's gonna be enough. That if people can see the code, then they can use it for whatever. Um, but the reality is that uh, if you don't give someone a license, then you're under default copyright, which is all rights uh, restricted, which means no one can use it for anything. Um, and so that's a pretty frequent one. We get occasionally people will submit their project to the free software directory saying, oh, this is my free software project, and you go there and there's absolutely no license or any mention of a license. Um, and you have to be like, well, you gotta pick a license, you gotta do something. <laughs> uh, and, but again, that can also be kind of a simple one because for a lot of people, you just default to the GPL, they just didn't understand, that they, they needed a license, they need to get something in there. Um, also quite common is someone will say, maybe in a readme or somewhere, um, they'll say, oh, this is, this is under the GPL, uh, but they don't include a copy of the license. Um, this one can kind of be annoying because, uh, you know, if it doesn't actually have the license, then it's kind of a question about, well, what the heck's going on here? Did they really intend to put it under the license if they didn't take the time to, to add it there? So it's definitely something you gotta correct. You can't just say in a readme that, oh, this is under the GPL and don't worry about it. You need to include a copy of the GPL somewhere in your project. Um, the funniest one to me <laughs> are people who have the opposite problem of our first category, where they've added license notices to all the files in their project, but they don't actually include a copy of the license itself. Um, and I guess it's maybe not so funny, but uh, part of that license notice says that if you didn't get a copy of the GPL to write to the FSF at such and such an address and get a copy of it. So we, we still occasionally get people writing to us for copies because they got some package that there's no copy of the license itself, um, just the little license notice included. Um, excuse me. Uh, and I can kind of understand uh, what the issue is there uh, with what the confusion is caused. For a lot of like pushover licenses, like if you have like a modified BSD or something, you just have this tiny little license, you put that at the top of your file, and that's your whole license, and that's, you know, that's all you gotta do. And so if someone was using those licenses, familiar with them, and they switch over to the GPL, they think, oh yeah, GPL, it's about this long, you should put it at the top of your file. Um, but you still want to include the license. Um, Again, with, um, in, in terms of uh, compliance, um, if it's your own project and you don't have a license on it, you're the copyright holder, you're gonna be okay. If you're including code from somebody else and they have licensed it under the GPL and you don't include a copy of the license, that's gonna be a violation. Um, that's something where someone's gonna have to come in and, and make sure that you actually correct it. Um, you know, a violation of the license like that, it may seem kind of ticky tacky, but it is a violation of copyright. Um, and usually if someone's got issues with, um, they're missing their, their copy of the license, there's gonna be other issues as well. Such as our third most popular <laughs> issue with free software projects in terms of uh, license compliance is that they don't have any source code, which kind of seems surprising, right? You'd think um, if you're making a free software project, at some point at least there'd be some source code available, uh, but frequently you'll have people who say, oh, this is free software, or they'll even say this is, you know, I'm licensing this work under the GPL, um, but they don't actually provide source code in any way. They'll just have a binary available, and they're like, yeah, people can share it and do, do whatever the heck they want, um, but they haven't provided source code at all. And you'll point it out to them and be like, oh yeah, we've got it in our repo, but it's, it's kind of a mess and we don't really want to have people looking at it and stuff. And it's like, well then, you don't really want to license your <coughs> work under free software license, right? Because the whole point here is that other people can get access to the source code itself. Um, 
and sometimes they'll understand that and be like, oh, I'll just put it up on GitHub or GitLab or what have you and let people actually see the source code. Um, so these last two uh, are getting into a little bit more tricky area in terms of, of compliance, like the first uh, issues we've been talking about in terms of common issues are very simple things. They're missing text, they're missing uh, you know, license notices and the GPL. Um, if you're completely missing your source, then that's a very basic problem. Uh, when it comes to missing some source code, uh, what will frequently happen is that they'll have written a bunch of stuff um, and they know that it actually relies on a bunch of other code, but they haven't actually added that in any way to the repo. Um, and so you can't actually build the software. Um, so that's kind of related to the incorrect build instructions where the ability to actually build the software won't be there. Um, like someone will download it and the, there'll be a ton of source that, you know, oh, I didn't, I forgot to push it. It's on my machine so I can build it myself. But, you know, I just didn't think to, to, to push this stuff or the instructions itself for building the software will be uh, non-existent or will be missing so many steps that, you know, someone else looking at the software won't be able to build it. Um, so for all three of these, you know, again, if it's your own project, you know, you're, you're not really a free software project if people can't actually use your free software and take it. Um, obviously, you're going to break your own builds at times when you're working on stuff and so people, you know, won't necessarily be able to build it. Uh, but when it comes to uh, compliance for other people, um, you know, if you're not providing source code, that's kind of the most obvious GPL violation you could commit. Um, with missing some source code and incorrect builds, that's also going to be an issue. And we frequently find what will happen with companies is they have a build guru, who's the one guy who knows how to build the source, and they built it. And once they had that binary, they fired that guy because they figured we'll never need to update the software ever again. And so then we find out, oh, you guys uh, don't actually have uh, source code provided in any way. And they're like, oh, well, we have it here. And they give it to us. They don't know how to build it, and they have no documentation of how to build it. And all of a sudden, they're looking at, oh, we either got to hire that guy back or maybe find somebody else to make a functioning build of this, or potentially maybe we'll just go bankrupt and not do software anymore. Um, so the final uh, common uh, licensing issue that we confront in our work is uh, in including non-free binaries. And this is kind of related to the missing source code. In some ways, you could say it's the same issue that if you have a binary included, um, you know, it's going to be uh, necessarily missing its, non, its, its source code because that's what the binary is. If you have provided the source code, then the source code wouldn't be missing. Um, but essentially, this kind of breaks down, in, in, again, in a few different uh, ways that essentially uh, they'll include binaries because they can't get their software functioning or it does something cool that they want, um, but it makes the software as a whole uh, non-free because they have essentially these proprietary pieces locked inside uh, their otherwise free software project. Um, and so for some of those, a lot of times you'll find out that it's not actually necessary. So it's something where they've included something uh, to make something simpler or do something else, but it's something where you can just say, oh, you know, here's a binary uh, that you've included. You know, what's the license on that? Oh, it's proprietary, just take it out. Um, but for some projects, they kind of build their whole system uh, working on the assumption that, oh, you know, we need this little binary in order to function. Um, and they're kind of stuck because <laughs> they, they essentially have to rewrite whatever that code is if they want to make their project actually free software. Um, and it can get a little tricky because they're like, well, you know, it's just this little piece of code and the whole rest of the thing is all free software. Um, but, you know, if you have one piece of code where people can't get access to the source code, um, and further, you know, these binaries could be licensed under all rights restricted or some other proprietary license where essentially they're, what they're doing is actually a violation of whoever created that binary. Um, so it causes all kinds of problems. There's also issues with non-free dependencies where, you know, it's just, it requires some non-free software. Um, you know, that's something that is kind of easy to fix because you can actually grant an exception on your GPL where you essentially say, yeah, okay, it's got this non-free thing that you're going to have to rely upon, but we're giving you permission to recombine and share with other people. Um, 
and, and, and that's, that's the, the real issue. I guess I, I kind of glossed over that, is when you have this non-free stuff included, um, even if you are the copyright holder on their work and you're all fine with having this binary in there, if someone else takes that work and tries to enjoy the rights under the GPL, they're technically in violation because they have no way of getting uh, the source code for those binaries, and they have no way of getting the permission to use those non-free uh, uh, bits of code uh, in order to, you know, modify and redistribute distribute the work. Um, so you're essentially preventing anyone who pays attention to their licensing issues from ever using your your software in the future at some point. Um, so. I started out talking about you know these tough issues in free software licensing, the ones that uh, a lot of us law geeks and lawyers like to spend our time on. Um, and as we can kind of see, uh, none of these issues are necessarily very tough, right? These issues that uh, users are confronting um, are the absolute basics of what it means to uh, distribute free software. You know, you have to have a license. You have to provide source code. Um, we recently did a, a little thing um, cataloging the most frequent questions that we get uh, in our licensing queue of uh, our team of volunteers who answer questions. And number nine was, can I sell free software? Which, if you're not familiar, yes, you absolutely can sell free, uh, free software. It's about freedom, uh, not about price. Um, and it's one of the basic tenets of, of what free software is. Um, and I know that on top of that, uh, I've had that the same conversation about probably 20 times here at this conference itself of people talking about, oh, w w these people are selling free software, what the heck are they doing? And explaining that, no, it's, you're allowed to sell free software. So I think we spend a lot of time on those fun, tough questions, but, um, oh shoot, I forgot. One, la one last category of, of common issues. Um, incompatibility, this is much rarer. Uh, this, is, this gets into some of the tough issues that people like to talk about is compatibility issues. Um, but we don't, you don't see it all that often. You'll see someone combining some code from another project that tends to be non-free. It'll be some sort of license that looks like a free software license, but it's actually not free. Or they'll be using code from two code bases that are both copyleft, um, which means that they're going to clash and that they can't be compatible together. Um, much more common is uh, adding your own restrictions. People like to do things where they say, it's under the GPL, but the military can't use it, or it's under the GPL, but companies can't use it. Um, and that's a pretty frequent problem where essentially they don't understand that when you put something out under the, free, the GPL, any restriction that you add on top of that it can just be taken away and disappear um, by, by right of the, the license itself. It, it dictates that. Um, but also they don't understand that the restrictions that they're adding are non-free, which goes back to that, that issue of uh, selling free software where people don't really understand um, you know, the very basic fundamentals of what it means to be free software. Um, ah, so <laughs> this was the slide I thought I was getting to. So I talked about, you know, the tough problems, the interesting problems that lawyers and law geeks like to spend our time on. They're not really the tough problems because they're not really the problems that we need to solve right now uh, when it comes to software licensing. Um, the real tough problem is that everyone in our community, even people who, um, care about free software and love free software and they want to distribute free software don't know the very fundamental basics. Um, and you may have noticed at the start I was explaining how part of my job was education, so I have to take some personal claim to the failure of making sure that people understand uh, the, the licensing basics. Um, but the reality is that I'm just one guy and it needs to be a team effort from everybody to kind of fix this actual real problem in free software licensing. Um, so one of the big questions is, how do, how do we actually get to these people? Because uh, if you're on the FSF mailing list, you've probably received uh, several hundred emails from me over the year, years talking about free software uh, licensing. Um, you know, I'm obviously here at the conference uh, trying to talk with people who make free software or who are excited about free software. Um, but we need to find out a way to really actually get to the people who are out there developing software and make sure that they get a hold of you know, these kind of very basic rules of how licenses work. Um, another big step is going to be working on our educational materials. Um, we've got a lot of educational materials and I will be the first to admit that the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions, 
document that we have put together is maybe more of an asked questions document rather than frequently asked questions because it's got a lot of those tough, interesting questions on there. Um, but we're, we're currently working on making some easier to parse, uh, more shareable, uh, simpler instructions on you know, these absolute basics, these common issues that we're constantly uh, confronting. Um, finally, development tools. So we've been, it, we, a few years back now, uh, announced criteria on uh, repositories. So if you're using GitHub or GitLab or Savannah or something like that, uh, we put together criteria for what it means to be an ethical um, repository provider. Uh, because people maybe don't realize it, but even if these tools are running Git or whatever, they can still have proprietary software like at Git, GitHub, they use non-free JavaScript. Um, you know, they have other tools available that are also proprietary software. Um, but one of those things that we grade them on is how they deal with licensing defaults. So if you go right now to GitLab or GitHub and you create a project, you can just leave it with no license at all. You don't have to add a license to your project and you can make it public. And that's a huge part of the reason why so many people, you know, are making free software projects without a license because they think, oh, if I put it on GitHub, then people can see the source code and that means I'm free software. Um, but if you make the default to be that you must do a license or at least give a warning saying, hey, this is gonna be proprietary software or you know, no one can use this software, you shouldn't make it public unless you're going to actually add a license. It can make a big difference for shifting that. Um, so we've been working with them on uh, various parts of the criteria. Hopefully we can upgrade uh, some of those other repositories. Um, but as I said before, I'm just one guy and I'm not gonna be able to do it all by myself. And so I need people who can help out. Um, I mentioned a few times uh, during this talk the free software di directory. I don't think I actually explained it uh, previously, but essentially the free software directory is a volunteer run project to catalog all the free software in the world. And it's secretly a project to review all the free software in the world for licensing issues. Um, because the only way you can get in is to have someone, a volunteer look through the software and actually look at, you know, is this free software, are the licenses correct? Um, and so this is a volunteer run project. Uh, we have meetings every Friday at uh, 12 Eastern time in the FSF uh, IRC channel. It's just pound FSF. Uh, we also have a mailing list. And because it's a volunteer project, it's a great way to get involved. If you're a licensing nerd and you're someone who loves to, to look at packages and find the problems, this is a perfect opportunity to get involved. Um, on top of the directory work, uh, I mentioned also uh, answering questions from the community. Um, we can always use more licensing nerds if you're familiar with the GPL. If, if you know that you can sell GPL software, you could be a licensing team volunteer and help answer questions from the community. Um, and that's another one where we work through IRC and email um, and there's tons of, there are a lot of, we do get interesting questions, they're not as frequent, but we also get a lot of people who just need the basics and they just need help. Um, and finally, uh, pushing for tools with same defaults. So, you know, if, it, if you have choices when it comes to your repositories, use ones that will help encourage other people that, to do proper practices when it comes to licensing. Use tools that have educational materials that are actually helpful. Um, and when those tools aren't available, make sure to let those companies that are providing poor tools know that they need to correct this thing because it's a big issue. Um, We'd like to get these common issues out of the way so we get back to the fun stuff of arguing over you know what the particular term in a license is um, and that's that's essentially it that's that's the stuff i wanted to go over i i hope uh, you guys all enjoyed uh getting maybe a little bit of a laugh or having your eyes opened at uh what the state of licensing is in in the real world um and i invite questions So that, that's kind of an interesting one because there, there is, it's, it's not necessarily uh, 
that example is maybe not misinformation. So let me, let me get to misinformation first. Uh, yes, there are people who are out there trying to misinform, um, especially, uh, obviously, we don't use the term open source at the Free Software Foundation, uh, but it's pretty popular for referring to the software, you know, referring to free software. And there's definitely a push by people to change the meaning of that. Um, to essentially mean just putting your source code up on a repo without actually doing it. Um, I've read several articles where people are saying that the term open source means that, that it doesn't matter that there's an OSI with the definition and whatnot, and that it, the way people use it means that as long as the source code's up on the Git repo, it doesn't matter about the license. Um, and obviously, we don't, we don't care for those people. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they're talking about the term open source, which, which we don't use. Um, but we, you know, we'd worked kind of long and hard to get people to understand that free software and open source uh, are both referring to the same type of thing that, uh, you know, meet the same category definition. And so, you know, I've had, I've had online discussions where people have told me that I'm incorrect, that open source means essentially that public source where there's no license, and what I'm talking about is just free software, right? Which is funny as a person at the FSF, but unfortunate because you know, a lot of people do refer to uh, free software as open source, um, so that is damaging. Uh, with the license notices thing and Node.js, there's work, I don't, I don't know that I would call it misinformation because what people are doing is they're pushing for um, trying to tweak the best practices when it comes to doing the license notices. Um, this is something also with people do, working in the embedded space where, um, you know, like, uh, where people want to, they're worried about the size of the notices, you know. Every single file having this notice in some applications, you know, doesn't necessarily work. Um, and I think that's more of a community discussion about how to evolve those best practices and maybe, you know, maybe changing things up. Right now, obviously, the best practice is to include your full notice. Um, but, yeah, I'm not sure it's misinformation. I think it's people pushing for something different. Any other questions? It doesn't have to be about the, this talk. I can also just answer licensing stuff as well if you're just had a pressing yeah, well, question. I was wondering about, uh, I work with a medical device company mm -hmm. uh, and we're uh, looking to create a visualiz visualization uh, appliance uh, that basically runs on Linux uh, instead of the, the Windows box we now have. Um, but, so, I will be for at least uh, uh, providing the source code and, and giving it uh, uh, at least some, some instructions on how to install your own kernel, for instance, or, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there comes the, uh, the medical side of things where we don't want uh, people to uh, install their own software and mm -hmm. making the whole machine, because it's, it's basically uh, uh, a single purpose, purpose device. Yeah, uh, it's meant to be used in an OR, so you don't want just anyone to have access to it. Uh, and uh, changing something that shouldn't be changed. Um, so how would that? Would it be okay to uh, do do a proper proper licensing notice and and provide uh, a location for? For getting all the source code and stuff like that, and also providing uh, an instruction on how you could uh, install it, but then uh, the, the actual uh, application that's running on there uh, would notice that when it when something is changed, it doesn't do uh, the function anymore that it's designed for. Um, basically, basically, to prevent uh, misuse. Is is it? Are you worried about someone sneaking into the OR and changing things, or are you worried about people modifying their own? Yeah, well, it's it, it's it's a it's probably also a liability thing that when they change their machine, that that the warranty is not there anymore, and, and yeah, so we don't get sued because yeah. there's, there's so, something happened on, in the OR and, mm -hmm. and and someone changed it. I mean, so th this is one of the the, the more interesting questions. Yeah, we we, we, we discussed. Uh, this stuff quite a bit, but uh, you know, essentially, it's kind of like with with anything else. You know, what's to stop people from ripping off parts of the machine? Yeah, or, that's you know, 
you're, you're not in charge of what they actually do. No. Maybe you want to put in a notice, you know, more. so the GPL allows you to modify the warranty disclaimer yep. um, to f fit your own purposes. So that would generally be what people would, would want to do in that situation to make the warranty disclaimer notices or the limitations of liability, you know, be like, hey, if you modify this, we're absolutely not going to be involved with whatever you've done. Yep. Um, but, you know, it's the same as, you know, people could rip rip out wires or do whatever yeah, they want. That, that's, and that's a big you don't think that you would be liable for what was going on if people were ripping out the wires. And it's the yeah. same It's the same deal. Yeah. Um, pe people often worry about medical liability or automotive, like uh, with the cars. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, we can't let people have access to the software in the car because what if they modify it and you crash? Obviously, cars you can modify already. That's what mechanics have done for, yeah. you know, there's a whole thing with people who want to modify their cars. There's no difference when it comes to the software. It's the exact same thing. I, I have talked with some, some devs over there who say, no, it's different because it's possible that they can modify it in such a way that it won't show, we won't be able to prove that they had modified it and then we'd be liable. Um, it sounds, but, sounds like he has the same similar problem that Boeing might have with continental changes in the software. So you buy a Boeing 737 and a continental yeah. carrier yeah. and they have their own branding or something. Yeah. No, that, 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 I think Boeing. I think Boeing's got bigger problems when it comes right. to their software, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I yeah. think all of that can be taken care of with, with outside of the open source license, with just disclaimers on the warranty statements, and yeah. support statements, and on the liability statements. Yeah. Yeah. That that would generally be the way they would do it, just as you've dealt with liability in the past. And the other thing is, you know, people worry about, oh, there's, you know, these dice devices have to be licensed by the FDA and, and yada yada and all this stuff. There's nothing in a free software license that gives you permission to violate any other law, no. you know. So if someone is, is modifying these devices in violation of the FDA or something like that, the GPL is not giving them a free pass to do that. They still have to comply with, you know, with whatever the other laws are. So. I apologize if I missed this from coming in late, but I've noticed, um, projects that list kind of a long string of licenses, they say, well, this is LGBL or MIT or this or okay. that. And I'm not sure how to analyze an or statement like that. <laughs> so, like, so what does this or, actually mean in practice? So, or would usually be uh, that they're doing like a dual license or a multi-license where you're allowed to choose which license it's under. You, you'll also find, if you've ever taken a look at the licenses, like in your phone or something, that you'll get a license file that has hundreds of licenses in it. And what that is is, I'm not sure where it came from, but the best practice kind of became, um, you know, if you're including a bunch of these pushover licenses, licenses without copy left in them, that they would include a copy of the license for each different package that they were including. So they end up with like, you know, a thousand different copies of essentially the modified BSD or something like that, but mixed in with a few other different pushover licenses, which makes it a real mess to, to sort through if you're just trying to, to look at it with your eyeballs. And so people have to use like scripting tools. But generally, if they say this license, you know, this software is available to you under the GPL uh, V3 or under, um, you know, the modified BSD or whatever, they're, they're doing a dual licensing uh, thing where they're offering it. You essentially get to pick. You say, oh, I'd rather use it under this license and I'll go and do whatever I need to do under that. So my, my follow up to that idea of um, you get to pick how is that choice stored, instantiated, recorded, made public? Uh, so if, you say, oh no, in our minds, yeah. we knew what we meant. <laughs> so, so when you go to redistribute it, you'll include the, the license. So you could include the exact same thing where you're like, you know, I've modified this and I've, I've passed it along and it's available under those six licenses or whatever it was. Usually they do too. I, I don't see too many three or fours uh, when it's like multiple licensing. Um, but yeah, so if like you wanted to use, say you, say you take this project where it's like, it's under the GPL, but you can also use it under modified BSD, you, it, but you want to make sure your code's all under the GPL, you just you know, make your modifications and you just pass it along just under the GPL, so you wouldn't have the copy of uh, you know, the other, <coughs> other license. So that would be how you do it. What I find is, is often where there's multiple licenses, it's Yeah. In um, all licenses, under different licenses, open licenses, but I mean, free licenses. <laughs> Thank you. But, but, uh, but different ones. Um, and what I'm finding that can 
consumer devices, you know, sometimes I get no money. Yeah. Sometimes I get just a little <coughs> paper with UPL or, or a artistic license from an end. Um, how do you think the consumer devices should be licensed? You know, give me a handbook of licenses probably isn't what the average consumer is looking for. Yeah, I mean... <coughs> So generally what I, so for the Respect Your Freedom certification program, I get to be involved with someone who's distributing consumer devices. And what I generally tell them is a good idea is to include um, the information uh, on a piece of paper. That's, that's my preference for like, get a, get a statement <coughs> saying we're under these various licenses. This is where you'll find the text of the license and this is where you're gonna find the source code. Um, you know, if it's if it's already on the device, then you know the person has a piece of paper. They're like, okay, there's a home directory or something where there's the million licenses that that need to so, be there. So fundamentally, a piece of paper with a name to it. I think for for user products, it's so helpful because um, when you open up the device, uh, you know, when you turn on the so for a lot of devices, there won't necessarily be a user user interface on the device to begin with, right? So um, and then for others, you know. The user interface may not be something standard. It can be, you know, it, for a router you have, you can, you know, right. uh, there's a couple different ways to interface with it, but it's not like your desktop computer or something where you can put a readme file on the, on the front of saying where, you know, where to get source to do a written offer of source. And then obviously, you know, I do that because nobody wants to do, uh, frequently they don't want to just include the source code on a CD or on the disk itself. Um, Obviously, if you include it there, that's the easiest way to go, but for just providing information, like a piece of paper that says where to get the full documents and, and the source code and stuff, for me at least, that, that's always, I found it pretty helpful. Um, especially like when we're trying to review these devices, devices and it comes in, I'm like, all right, so where, where is the offer of source, where, where is the source code, where's the licenses, stuff like that. It's like, if there's a piece of paper and I open up the box, it's easy. Sometimes I've seen, statement yeah that's yes that's that's definitely a common one or what'll happen is they'll they'll have it they'll say okay you go to yada 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 source code uh, slash source or something and then you go there and then the website isn't there anymore um, yeah. yeah no but I mean that's 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 really the the, the thing with um, you know, a part of the educational materials, like uh, we've been looking at, you know, I was talking with someone the other day about just what are the materials for, if I wanna do a device, like what's the basic steps that I gotta do to, to make it easy for people to see that I'm complying and that I have my source code and, and whatnot. Um, because we also have kind of the reverse problem also where we get reports of GPL violations where it's not a GPL violation, it's just that you couldn't find you couldn't find the piece of paper or what, what have you that says where the source code is. And, you know, at some point we figure it out. They're like, okay, it was in, you know, for a lot of times for programs like, a, you know, if you get like a web browser or something like that, it'll have in the about command, like up in the menu. If you don't look there, you'll never know what the license is. Um, but so it's, it's kind of the, the opposite side where it's people think there's a, a licensing issue, but there really isn't because it was just difficult to find. Um, and so that's definitely a part of improving the materials on, on how to do everything. Um, yeah, because right now we, we have a lot of resources on how to do licensing, um, but you know, I, I just trained a, a new team member that came on and it's like, it's such a massive amount of information put together all in one place um, that we need to, we're working on tools and resources to make it easier so that people can get the, the basics like, you know, <laughs> Yes, you can sell the, the software. Yes, please do actually provide the source code. Yes, please do include the license notices and licenses. Um, but that's, it's definitely the struggle. Yes. I, I would also say, you know, you, you talked about education for developers. Yeah. There's also really, you know, the licensing goes across to companies, not just the developers. Yeah, yeah. Often, in fact, personal, there's often a conflict between the development team and the management. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, we very frequently will have people working at a company that are ready, ready to release free software, um, but then they get to the legal department and they're told that uh, they're not going to, um, you know, it's not uncommon. We, you know, as part of our process for, um, you know, getting the copyright on the GNU project stuff so we can do the compliance work, um, we have to work with a lot of different companies, uh, attorneys, in sorting out uh, actually getting that code transferred over. And, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of lawyers, lawyers who get it, but there's also, even within the legal community, there's a lot of lawyers who don't understand um, anything about this stuff. And they're the people who are making de decisions for sometimes very large companies um, who are just not aware of, of even the basics. They're not, they're not on the mailing list arguing the tough stuff. They're sitting on the sidelines and, and know nothing about it. So um, we do have uh, resources directed at um, like the legal uh, lawyers and, and management type stuff. We offer continuing legal education seminars, which are something all lawyers have to take. It's uh, uh, accreditation requirements, um, as well as specific mailing lists and stuff directed at lawyers to try and help with that. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, again, it goes back to that question of reaching the right people, right? Because yeah. um, a lot of our materials, like we, the people who know the stuff know the materials and they come and see the materials, especially like when we add new stuff. You know, the people who already know the basics will come and see, you know, what, what we've done. But the people we need to reach who, you know, they're not on the mailing list, they don't, don't know about us, those are the guys out there who are they're writing tons of software, they want it to be free, they just don't know the basics of how to, how to do it and how to make things work. Other questions? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming out. I, I hope you had fun. I hope you come by and see me at the FSF table. Uh, we're in the back corner of the expo hall. Uh, we got some cool stickers and whatnot. And if you have, if you've wanted to ask a question but not in front of the class, you can come ask me over there. So, thank you all for coming out.